Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Packers Unscripted from Packers.com. I am Mike Spofford, joined, as always, by my partner in crime, Weston Hodkowitz. We are coming to you here from our studios at Lambeau Field to preview Sunday's win-to-get-in game for the Green Bay Packers. It will be against the Chicago Bears. It will be a 3.25 p.m. Central Time kickoff. Televised on CBS, Jim Nance, Tony Romo. I think this will be the first time those two will be doing a Packers-Bears game. I think so. I think. Yeah. Um, so interesting the way that sets up, and very interesting the way this season for the Chicago Bears has gone. We will preview this opponent thoroughly here on today's episode west the chicago bears started out the season 0 and 4 and looked like they were going absolutely nowhere and suddenly they are surging at the end of the season not only are they 4 and 2 in their last 6 games to get to 7 and 9 at this point but those two losses in their last 6 games they had double digit leads in the fourth quarter over two playoff teams in the Lions and the Browns, and they let those games get away, or the uh, the Bears are this close to being on a six- or a seven-game winning streak here. I said it in Monday's Insider Inbox. I may have even said it on our last show. I think the Chicago Bears, based on how they are playing right now, is the best team that the Packers have faced since the Kansas City game. And I would agree with that in a lot of regards because they're the most well-balanced. And when you look at where this offense has been, and I can't give you the exact breakdowns of what Justin Fields' stats are, what this offense's output was in the first half of the season when they had him and then when they finally got him back, but there just seems to be more swagger with the Bears' offense right now. Juice Herbert is coming off his first, I think, 100-yard games of the season back-to-back weeks. If, if at the very least, the first time he's had them back-to-back weeks here uh, this year. And then DJ Moore has come alive. I mean, this isn't the same situation as the first month of the season where there were these demonstrative actions after plays and a vi- you know visible frustration. The guy's a 1,300-yard receiver. He had yeah. a 200-yard game this season. And, you know, the Bears' offense is really flowing. But I'll tell you what, Mike, and we will preview both sides of these, you know, the, the football here, but... Montez Sweat in that trade, Ryan Poles took some flack there at the trading deadline for acquiring him because it's like, what are you doing? Where is the season going? Why do we need another defensive player? And Sweat has been exceptional. And I think... And they signed him to a big contract extension right after they acquired him. That was the whole point of getting him. It wasn't necessarily for this year. It was... They saw Montez Sweat as a as a building block for their defense for the future, and he's in the fold long term for them. And now. watching how Washington's defense is completely folded after oh my losing gosh. him, yeah, and then and they traded Chase Young as well yeah. from Washington. So. But I mean, man, Sweat yeah. is Sweat ended up being the guy, yeah. you know, for for Young being the second overall pick. So, but but all that stuff together, Chicago's feeling really good about itself right now. And Justin Fields, and you heard the cries out at Soldier Field last week, people saying we want Justin. This is a huge dress rehearsal to see if Justin Fields is going to be the Chicago Bears quarterback in 2024. Yeah, there's a there's certainly a lot of noise in that direction. I personally think it would be foolish for the Bears to hinge a decision like that on this one game, like win or loss or how he performs in this particular game. Four interceptions I, could make you change that idea, though. Yeah, well, or, you know, I mean, I just I don't think you ever hinge anything on one game when when it's it's a decision of that magnitude. That being said, Justin Fields, he's the leading rusher on this team, 630 rushing yards, and you know obviously part of the game plan will be to contain him. I think you have to try to make Justin Fields beat you from the pocket. That being said, you brought up DJ Moore, 92 catches, 1300 yards, eight touchdowns. Cole Komet, 70 catches, 678 yards, six touchdowns. Nobody else for the Bears has really done much of anything in the passing game this year. It has been those two guys, and certainly DJ Moore being the clear number one target for Fields. Um, And the other thing, I give credit to Fields, and and we'll talk more about the defense because I think that is really what has fueled this turnaround for the Bears. But Fields has also protected the ball much better. The Bears, over their last seven games, are plus 11 in turnover margin. They've gone from minus 2... Uh, I'm sorry, minus nine on the season to plus two in basically the last two months. That's hard to do. Um, And yes, the Bears defense is certainly taking the ball away, but Justin Fields and that offense 
they're protecting it as well. And uh, um, I think I think it'll be very interesting to see what the Packers do here because you have Jair Alexander coming back from suspension. Do you line him up on DJ Moore and say, all right, 23, that's your guy, you know, or do the Packers take a different approach with it? I'm not sure what Green Bay is going to do, but it is but it is very clear that you can't let Justin Fields run around back there and you can't let DJ Moore get loose. Yeah, it, it's almost, I, I joked about this in Insider Inbox, if you could just recreate what they did in week one, everything would be great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but obviously we're in a different part of the season. Both of these teams have grown in our different units going into this one. But you look at that opener, Mike, in addition to them getting an early turnover on downs, in addition to them turning over the football, Quay Walker's interception return for a touchdown. Right. DJ Moore had 25 receiving yards on two catches. Juice Herbert had 27 rushing yards on nine carries. The Bears weren't able to get much going until like garbage time in that game. Right. It was like exactly. 60,000 people down to like 3,000 by the time that game ended. Now, the one thing I will say, because you want to give Chicago its props, but at the same time also not act like you're facing the 72 Dolphins here, when you do look at their wins, it was Carolina. It was the Miami or Minnesota Vikings. An impressive win over Detroit at home after they almost beat them on the road. And then it was Arizona, and then it was Atlanta. They haven't really beaten any big-time playoff teams during this stretch. Yeah, except for the Lions. Except for the Lions. They, they knocked off the Lions and, frankly, should have swept the Lions. Should have swept should've them. Should have beaten them both times. But what's funny to me and what, what is very interesting for this matchup is this is an opportunity for the Green Bay Packers to show we are a playoff team. We aren't like these other squads. We're going to be able to get to that ninth win, and that's where the real challenge lies. But as you said, Michael, more than anything, it starts with Justin Fields. You want to make him a passer. You don't want to allow him to beat you with his legs and trying to keep as many bodies as possible on DJ Moore. That's the one aspect of this, especially if Darnell Mooney is not back from the concussion yet. You can devote resources to DJ Moore yeah. and play your hand with a lot of these other guys. It's not what the situation was last week against Minnesota. Yeah. Well, I think, honestly, what becomes an even bigger challenge for the Packers and what I think is really the more intriguing matchup in this game is a Packers offense that is very much on the rise. We've seen Green Bay against, you know, a couple of pretty good defenses in Carolina and Minnesota put up 30 plus points back to back weeks after not hitting the 30 point mark since week 1 all the way back in Chicago at the beginning of the year. But this Bears defense, Wes, I brought up these statistics in our three things video. When the Bears started the season 0 and 4, they were allowing 34.3 points per game. Yep. Their last 5 games in which they've gone 4 and 1, they've allowed 15.2 points per game. 19 points per game difference from the stretch at the beginning of the year to now this stretch at the end of the year. I don't know if I've ever seen a shift that big within within one season by a given unit. They've risen all the way to first in the league against the run. They are 12th overall in yards allowed, still 20th in points allowed, but I think a lot of that has to do with what was going on at the beginning of the year. Montez Sweat has six sacks for the Bears since he joined them at the trading deadline at the end of October. He has 12 and a half on the season, six of them with Chicago. A couple other statistics that jump out to me. One is the Bears have 22 interceptions, which is the highest total um, in the league. They have three different players with four interceptions. The cornerback Jalen Johnson, rookie cornerback Tyreek Stevenson, who is the reigning NFC Defensive Player of the Week, whereas Jordan Love is the reigning NFC Offensive yeah. Player of the Week. And then the third guy with the four interceptions is Tremaine Edmonds. And I think what we've seen, and I shouldn't say we've seen, I think what has happened with this Bears defense is very much what Matt LaFleur said in his Wednesday press conference after practice when I asked him about this Bears defense is, it's a group that has that has just settled in and played together and and figured some things out. You look back at the beginning of the season, Tremaine Edmonds, TJ Edwards, those were brand new guys, free agents that they brought in to play linebacker. You had Stevenson was a rookie, a second round pick out of Miami at cornerback. They were they were fitting trying to fit in all of these different pieces defensively. This unit has really, really come together. And when I look at the 22 interceptions number, and as I mentioned, plus 11 for the Bears in turnover margin in the last seven games, Packers have done a really good job protecting the football for the most part this year. It is absolutely paramount in this game. Absolutely. And what, what I find most um, startling about the Bears these days is, looking specifically at those inside linebackers, if I may, for years the Bears developed – 
incredible Pro Bowl linebackers. Oh, yeah. Uh, routinely, even after Brian Urlacher. Yeah, I mean, just, they traded away Roquan Smith to yeah. the to the uh, Baltimore Ravens. And it's just very interesting to me that they it, it started right around when Vic Fangio was there, where then they started, okay, now we're going to start signing inside linebackers. Maybe we're not developing them the way we used to. We're going to start signing them. They obviously did get Roquan. But then they went back to this blueprint of bringing in inside linebackers veterans and having them at the core of the defense different gms have done it different defensive coordinators have done it but chicago's had a lot of success with it and with tj edwards and tremaine edwins together building you know two guys with over 100 tackles each this season i think it, it kind of got back to the roots of this defense sweat made a lot of sense for them because that was the only thing they were truly lacking they just didn't have a pass rusher they didn't have an edge rusher and he's more than just a, you know, a guy that's going to rush off the edge. I mean, he's a pretty complete defensive end. Yeah. But they needed somebody that was going to be able to dial up the pressure a little bit because Jalen Johnson is an incredible cornerback. Yeah. Uh, Eddie Jackson has been a pro bowler in this league before. And as we're learning now uh, with this young man, Stevenson, Tyreek Stevenson, they, they seem to have found another guy that can be a perimeter threat for them. So it's a pretty complete unit. And I tip my hat to Ryan Poles because they've basically done this in a little over a span of a year and how they've remade this whole thing. So while you have a lot of veteran presence there, they had to sort of grow together and I think you're starting to see that. Yeah, and there there are a lot of there are a lot of statistics with regard to this Bears defense that in some respects you you throw out the window. For the season, they are still last in the league in sacks per pass play. Yeah. And that that just I to me that just tells you how much they struggled to get after the quarterback until Montez Sweat came on the scene for them and and has been a presence in the pass rush the last couple of months. They're also 29th in the league still on in third down efficiency on defense again to me that's a reflection of just how much they were struggling before they really uh before they really got things going here down the stretch so um you know when you talk about other than protecting the football when you talk about keys you know keys to victory on on offense here for green bay i think it's you know as much as you as much as you have to respect the bears defense and where they are and what they're doing if you're the Packers and the way you've been playing lately, you just you just say, hey, we've got to we've got to keep doing what we're doing. We just whatever is called, we have to execute it at the level that we've been executing it. And it shouldn't matter that much what's going on on the other side. And uh, because that's the way the Packers have played these last couple of games. Frankly, that's how they've they've looked on offense since the uh, since the Giants game. I yeah. mean, I know. The Buccaneers game was all about, you know, the all the breakdowns on defense. The Packers offense actually did pretty darn well against a good Buccaneers defense in that game, but just couldn't keep up, obviously. I think since the Giants game, the Packers offense has been operating at a really, really high level, and they've got to find a way to maintain that against, I think, the best defense, the best defense they've faced in quite a while. Yeah, and it's a great point you raised there because I think for Green Bay, what's gonna be very interesting this week is seeing exactly what this offense is going to look like and who's going to all be available in very few instances could i say the packers having a de what an injury report that's nearing 20 i think somewhere around there yeah that it actually somewhat benefits them because now you have christian watson back at practice now you have Jaden reed back at practice don tavian wicks there's going to be a multitude of guys that could potentially be in the cards for Green Bay. I'm envisioning on Friday afternoon several questionable players going into this matchup. <laughs> yep. And it's up to Chicago to account for that. So in, in addition to the fact that we have Luke Musgrave now in what would be his, what, third week of being able to practice. So it's a lot of things for Chicago co to consider. And with as, as much as Green Bay has had to grind and fight through injuries, they are starting to get relatively healthier in terms of just the body count being on the field. Yeah. In that way, you wonder how much Matt LaFleur, his coaching staff, if they feel okay about certain guys, what they can build off of that. Because Jalen Johnson's super talented. Stevenson's super talented. But... The thing Green Bay has really been quietly developing here is an offense that you can't just kind of zone in on two guys. It's going to be the whole entree uh, that you're going to be cha challenged with. Yeah, and when you look back at the first game of the season, it, it's just another example of just how long ago it was and how different everything is. The Bears will certainly be, the Bears will certainly be prepared for the two big <clears throat> explosive plays Aaron Jones made against them at Soldier Field. Yep. There was the throwback screen that he took down the sideline almost for a touchdown. Then there was uh, there was the one-on-one -on -one matchup with the linebacker um, that uh, he took the short throw and, and took it the distance for a touchdown there. But, you know, 
Christian Watson wasn't on the field in week one. Dontavian Wicks wasn't getting a whole lot of snaps. We'll see if he comes back this week. Um, Jaden Reed was certainly a, a, a part of things in week one, but I think we've seen we've seen him certainly become a bigger part yep. of things. The Packers tight ends. Tucker Craft, you know, he was an afterthought back in week yes. one, and look what he's doing for the Packers now. We'll see. I think if, he played if, three snaps, if I remember. Three right. snaps is that what it was? Yeah. So, and we'll see if uh, if Luke Musgrave actually gets cleared to come back um, in in any kind of a role this week. He is uh, he is out on the practice field on a limited basis. There's there's just there's so much about both the Bears defense and the Packers offense that it's almost like, you know, other than those couple of Aaron Jones plays, I don't even know if there's anything on the film from week one that's worth looking at for either of these teams in, in as far as those two sides of the ball. Yeah, because I mean even David Bakhtiari's not out there right, right. like he was right. in week one when he had some uh, you know very funny and photogenic moments with the <laughs> Soldier Field. But, but hey, th- this is what it's all about, Michael. And, and I wrote in our Insider Inbox column on Thursday that when the NFL made the switch and they wanted to end division games on the season, and yeah. that be the, the finale of these, they, they wanted high dra- dra- I can't speak today, Michael. That's high okay. drama moments. Yeah. And, and that's what you're getting in things like this. Yes, Chicago Bears, I think of like no chance to make the playoffs now right i think they got that yeah they've been eliminated yeah but green bay much like last year with detroit everything is still out for them and you just need to win and get in and that's what makes it fun in week 18 yeah well we've mentioned containing justin fields we've mentioned uh dj moore and uh and trying not to let him get loose protecting the football on offense from this secondary that that likes to get its hands on a lot of footballs Anything else from a keys to victory standpoint that uh, that stands out to you right now? Stopping Khalil Herbert. It's the number one thing for me. Uh, as much as this is about fields and more, Herbert is the guy that if you allow them to continually win down in distance, you're going for a long afternoon. And Green Bay did an exceptional job. Other than a few ga- a few runs that, that fields leaked out for, they largely contained the run yeah. very well at Soldier Field in week one. Yeah. This run defense has been through some trials and tribulations this season. No doubt. Isaiah McDuffie currently out with a con- concussion, but now you got Devondre Campbell back at practice. Y- you know, you're, you're having to kind of mix and match here a little bit, but it seems to be you're getting closer to what would be your preferred starting lineup. Can you take advantage of that against this opponent? I think that's going to be really critical because the more that they are able to run with Juice Herbert, the more it's going to stress the other things trying to make sure you limit the explosive plays with DJ Moore, which can happen not just on a, you know, go route. He could take an underneath pass 70 yards if he wants to. Yeah, and that and that's where for me, sorry to interrupt you, no. but I but but one thing that stands out to me in this game as a key to victory because there are certain games based on the way teams play and and the way the Bears in particular they like to throw a lot of horizontal passes they like to throw the bubble screens and and uh, and uh, and all that sideways stuff you have to tackle you yeah. cannot let them break tackles your the, the tackling has to be on point because um, because as you just said DJ Moore DJ Moore can take a bubble screen at the 25 yard line and go 75 yards for a touchdown and suddenly you're in big trouble yeah yeah and so I think the more if you're able to Slow down the run there early. Generate some more takeaways. Mike, how much time did I spend last week talking about how much Green Bay needed to get some takeaways? And you saw the benefit of it in that first half against um, Minnesota with Absolutely. two touchdowns coming off of takeaways that were both deep inside Minnesota territory. Th- that's the key. And you have to make sure that I think a fast start will go a long way here as well because as I was researching and you and I talked a little bit about on Wednesday you know Chicago hasn't given up a touchdown here and I think over a month in the first quarter I don't even know if they've given up a points going back until maybe the Carolina game in the first quarter so that's pretty amazing the, the, being able to, to set yourself up and, and get yourself going with momentum I think is going to be critical this team plays different when they get stuff going early the offense does the defense does and I think that's really the path for Green Bay into the playoffs yeah one one last quick thing before I shift gears to sponsor business and the playoff picture. Any thoughts on the Pro Bowl situation? The Packers didn't get any Pro Bowlers, five guys as alternates. I'll just I'll just start with this. Yeah. I don't I don't always like to say, oh well this guy should have been a Pro Bowler because then you have to say like, well, who's not? And there are a lot of good players in this league and a lot of guys having good seasons and all that. 
what I think is maybe the most distressing thing to me is that for the season he's having and that he has the third most touchdown passes in the entire NFL right now, that Jordan Love didn't even make the alternate list at quarterback in the yeah. NFC. He wasn't like, in the top 10 in fan voting. Like that, that's, that, that's, that's a little just, and I understand the first half of the season, nobody was, you know, nobody out there was really thinking he was a pro bowler and, and he's come on strong late. And that's a lot of times how, you know, guys get overlooked and whatnot. But I would have thought at least Jordan Love would be on the alternate list somewhere here. And, and unfortunately, that didn't happen yeah I, I know I you, there were four teams that didn't have a didn't have a pro bowler and I think it was Washington New England and maybe Carolina yeah uh and then the Green Bay Packers one of those things is not like the other <laughs> but uh I don't know how much they weigh the fan vote anymore I don't know what that formula is I don't feel like it's an even third 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 yeah they used to they they used to say that that's what it was and I'm not sure that I'm not sure that I mean, it really Mike, is anymore for all we know the fan voting is simply ceremonial at this point and somebody else is making all these selections I don't know in which case it still doesn't make any sense yeah. but uh, Oren Burks overtook uh Rashawn Gary for the 10th spot at outside linebacker in the final fan vote God bless you Oren a lot of respect for you. He started four games this season. So it's just like, that's where, to me, I, I think there needs to be a certain amount of responsibility tied into this thing of, hey, who exactly is eligible? I mean, I, you can get vote for everybody. That's fine. But, like, is this going to end up being, like, I, I don't know. But yeah. be that as it may, the Green Bay Packers have five alternates. I would think, unless the Packers, of course, are playing in the Super Bowl, Rashawn Gary probably does have a good chance at this thing as a first alternate. Uh, but but still no, it's disappointing. I thought Jordan Love had a really strong season. I wish you know Elton Jenkins would have gotten a little bit more flowers. I know it was a tough start for him when he was playing out of position again, but you know I, I think he settled in slowly and surely and and worked through some injuries for this team. And then Keyshawn Nixon being the the leading person for the fan vote under return specialist, and then being what a you know an alternate in there somewhere too like yeah he's in, he's in the alternate mix yeah for it's just yeah just disappointing but yeah. it is what it is i'm sure no one else really cares about it yeah i i honestly don't care that much about it but i do i do wish that jordan love had at least been on the alternate he list was there, behind so. sam howell for most of the season too sam howell was the 10th spot justin fields overtook howell at the end in the fan vote which i agree with but it's like so where is Sam Howell getting all these votes from? Yeah. Can't, Jordan Love can't get any love. No pun intended. All right. Well, Sirius XM Radio, Sirius XM NFL Radio delivers hard-hitting analysis and up-to-the-minute NFL news that true football fanatics need 24-7, 365. And at Cousin Subs, we have something for everyone, like our Wisconsin cheese curds, mac and cheese, golden fries, and creamy shakes, all paired with your favorite sub or sub in a bowl, Cousin Subs, 50 years of better. All right. Well, as we said at the top of the show, as you recently alluded to, it is a win-to-get-in game for the Green Bay Packers. If the Packers beat the Bears, they are in the playoffs as either the 6 or 7 seed. Whether or not they would be the 6 or the 7, if they do indeed get that victory, will hinge on the Rams facing the 49ers. If the Rams win, the Rams are the 6 seed. If the Rams lose, then that's where things could change. The other games that uh, that factor into this whole nfc playoff picture right now as far as who's going to get which seed dallas is at washington philadelphia is at the giants and minnesota is at detroit now i i laid out all of the possibilities in the path to the playoffs article it was posted wednesday on packers.com if you haven't seen it go take a look basically it's all the possibilities as to as to whether the how the packers would get the six seed or the seven seed and then who their possible opponent would be, the three possible opponents being Dallas, Detroit, and Philadelphia. Um, Dallas can get either the two, the three, or the five. Detroit can get either the two or the three seed. Philadelphia can get either the two or the five seed. And then, of course, whoever ends up winning the NFC South, which right now the Buccaneers are the ones in control, and as long as they can beat the last place team in their division, Carolina, the Buccaneers will be the four seed. Um, as the as the nfc south champion so a lot of a lot of stuff going on here um but the way it turned out the way it turned out with regard to the nfc east you've had dallas and philadelphia fighting they currently have the same record um but 
they're not playing each other in this final game because they've already played twice. Yeah. They're playing, you know, they're split and both on the road <clears throat> playing Washington and uh, and the New York Giants. All these games will be going on at the same time at the in the three twenty five Central Time, yeah. the late afternoon window. So uh, we'll we'll just we'll have to see how it how it all sorts out. The bottom line is the pa- the Packers need to win to get in. That's the only thing you can control, and the rest of it is the rest of it's out of your hands, and you have to just see where the chips fall. I will say this though: um, again, Packers have to take care of their business, and nothing else matters. But I'll be interested to see how Seattle does with Arizona going into um, whatever that stadium's called now. It used to be University of Phoenix in Scottsdale. Uh, the Cardinals played really Glendale, actually, not what Scottsdale. Is it? Glendale. Glendale. It's in Sorry. Glendale, Arizona. I like Scottsdale though. I want to retire. That's okay. Yeah, that's it's it's probably a more enjoyable. It's been an city. A plus show for me today. <laughs> Just knocked it out of the park. But uh, Cardinals played really lively ball there in the second half. They made some mistakes, but Kyler Murray had that offense believing in the second half. And seeing you know Trey McBride, they have some young talented players there. I mean, didn't uh, didn't result in a lot of wins this season with Murray missing half the season, but that. <laughs> Seattle isn't just going to roll in there and expect to win that game. I expect no. that to be a competitive football game. And then Carson Wentz versus Sam Darnold for all the marbles. I mean, that, that's what everybody was looking forward to in Week 18, right? Yeah, and the that's what we all hey, that's what we all game. thought in Week 18, Rams. That that's where, that's where I mean things got because last week last week both of the number one seeds in each conference got decided. Yeah, you know, the Niners locked up. The Niners locked up the one seed in the NFC because of that Eagles loss to the Cardinals, and then the Ravens, um, the Ravens locked up the number one seed in the AFC. So now you have, you you have the the Niners are going to play their backup quarterback, and the Rams, who know they're either going to be the six or the seven, they've decided to rest Matthew Stafford yep. and and give him a chance to to heal up and uh and on the AFC side the Pittsburgh Steelers certainly have a path to the playoffs with a victory if they can if they can beat Baltimore but Baltimore on uh, on Saturday I believe it's Saturday afternoon that yep. game um Baltimore is not playing for anything and uh and the Steelers might be able to slip in with a uh, a win over the number 1 seed um but with Baltimore resting some guys yeah so it's going to be fun to to see how that all works out I, I think Buffalo versus Miami is going to be a really good game I I do like that they threw that one in the prime time spot. yeah that made that made all the sense in the world that that uh, with that game being for a division title and actually and you know Buffalo could be playing for either the division title or no playoff spot at yes. all like depending on how things go earlier in the day Miami knows that it's in the playoffs Obviously, if you're Miami, you'd much rather win the division and and be playing at home well, in the postseason yeah. as to going on the road, where they know they're going to have you know the good weather and everything they're used to. Whereas if they go on the road, you know you never know. Well, they just got ran off the East Coast last week. Yeah. So when you look at Buffalo and Miami, two teams who have been very up and down through the course of the season. Obviously, the Dolphins not so much, but I mean the the losses and the scale, the losses that they've had have been somewhat noticeable seeing which team is going to be able to kind of build some momentum for a playoff push here, or in Buffalo's case, if it would all fall apart altogether. And I'll tell you this, Michael, too, 11-5 and five versus 5-11, and 11, Philadelphia versus New York is not a game just to completely roll out. Because if Philly loses that, I don't care who's playing, who's not playing, the Eagles effectively just, like, dove into the playoffs. Yeah. Meanwhile, the Giants... And Brian Dabble, who was feeling okay about themselves after the win against Green Bay, they've been trickling down here as well. Yeah. I mean, they got a lot of things to figure out. So, and then they took the Rams to the wire last and week, with, you know, with a big punt return and some interceptions. You know, pull, tried to pull off a big comeback there, didn't quite work out. But, uh, but the the Giants definitely showed showed a lot of signs of life last yeah. week against uh, against the Rams and almost got themselves a big win. Last question: Pittsburgh, can they beat Tyler Huntley? I think they can. Yeah. I mean, if if Pittsburgh if Pittsburgh can cross the country and go in and beat Seattle um, with with as much as was at stake in that game for both teams, like the Steelers did last week to help out the Packers, I think they can definitely beat the Ravens and put themselves in a position where the Steelers and all their fans will be scoreboard watching on Sunday to see if they get the right results. I think a lot of it hinges on Jacksonville's game and and some other things. You know, Steelers are looking to get that win and then get the right results on Sunday to get a wild card spot. The thing I love about what Pittsburgh has done, though, 
Mason Rudolph becoming the quarterback again, it reminds you of like the Steve Bono, the Doug Peterson era, the, the places where you just had a backup quarterback somewhere <laughs> that just graduates into a starting role. However, that circumstance might play out. He's put he's put like sixty some points on the board in the last two weeks when we <laughs> nobody had heard a peep out of him all year long. It's just it's it is crazy how this league works sometimes. Yep. Yeah, I mean they just get these guys that have been in a system, had some ups, had some downs, but have basically stayed around the program. Yeah. And then here, here you are on the cusp of a playoff push. Yeah, well, it should be a wild and wacky Sunday of NFL football. The biggest thing that on uh, the Packers' agenda is the Bears and getting a win and getting into the postseason. And uh, that's, uh, that's job one, and we'll see how the rest of it shakes out. So with that, we'll call it a wrap on this edition of Packers Unscripted. Be sure to follow all of our coverage of the team and everything from Sunday's game at Lambeau Field Week 18, Packers and Bears in January. We'll have it for you on Packers.com. For Wes, I'm Mike. Thank you for tuning in, everybody. We will see you next time.